Apparently, two deadly terrorist suspects in Canada were on police radar. The question I would have out of that is this. I mean, there was 90 passports seized in that particular operation of, from 90 different individuals. Well, two of those individuals have now killed people in terror attacks. Uh, yeah. What about the other 88? Have we got 88 more of these to go? Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. Welcome to the Goddard Report. My guest is Leo Knight, former Vancouver and RCMP officer, an expert in security issues across the board, a newspaper columnist in the Vancouver province. Welcome to the show, Leo. Thank you. Horrible incident in Ottawa. A young Canadian reservist shot and killed while being an honor guard at the unknown soldier's tomb in front of the parliament buildings. Then the alleged uh, suspect shot and killed by the sergeant at arms. Leo, I know you're a professional taking a look at it now. We've had some time. Uh, the police response first off, what you thought happened and how it worked. Well, I thought the police response uh, was excellent. I should also add that it wasn't just the sergeant at arms who uh, who shot and killed. I mean, you hear on the uh, the Globe Mail reporter's uh, video, uh, you hear uh, the gun shot from the shotgun, and then um, you hear a whole bunch of maybe as many as 30 or 40 nine millimeter rounds after that so clearly the police were involved in that as well all the officers you saw in that video advancing down the hallway yes. and uh, obviously putting their lives on the line to protect everybody else well it's the nature of policing is that you run towards danger that's the nature of the job and, and same thing for reporters because <laughs> <laughs> so you get to be sort of safely somewhat behind <laughs> yeah well we're lucky that you're there uh, the media coverage, people, again, always critical that, okay, why didn't you mention this or, or why was that mentioned? It seemed to me that they were trying to get as much accurate information as they could on the air. Yeah, and, and certainly that is a struggle, especially with these days with so much competition on the cable networks and everything else. Uh, you're trying to get as much information on the air as you can. You want to also make sure that it's accurate before you put it out there. So that's uh, that's that real sort of fine fine line that they tread. And yeah. certainly in the, in the initial moments of this thing, that first sort of half hour, um, you know, as it, as the story was breaking and, uh, nobody really knew if it was one, two or three gunmen. They thought there was multiple locations. Uh, the mall down the street was, uh, locked down at one point. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. It's the so-called fog of war. And of course, too, when you have high powered rounds going off, like were fired by the, the gunman who attacked the soldier. There's high buildings around there. They echo off, and we've seen this in the investigation into the Kennedy assassination. People thought there were shots from areas that would have echoed, and so it would seem maybe the shot came from your left when actually it came from your right. Yeah, it's entirely, that that happens. It's natural in any sort of downtown area uh, where you get that sort of, um, uh, that's the word I'm looking, not cavern effect, but rather canyon effect. Right, so you do seem to hear multiple reports. MPs who were interviewed after the incident was wrapped up said that they, they were glad that security worked, but they hope that uh, the security measures, we know they will be beefed up after this, that they still don't uh, keep the public excluded from the home of uh, parliamentary democracy here in Canada. Yeah, indeed. There's a few things that sort of come up with me, and uh, I mean, I would ask the question, it hasn't been brought out yet, how we got into center block. Um, my guess is, and it's strictly a guess at this point, is that the soft entrance into center block is the access point used by MPs and media, people who have been checked out, been issued passes to uh, to go through, because the members of the general public have to go through, much like an airport, they have to go through a magnetometer screening area in order to get in. Well, clearly a guy running in with a shotgun isn't going to get through that. Um, so, you know, it, it, in all probability, he, uh, he probably bullwashed his way through the, the security guard at the MPs and media point, and then he's in the building. So that would probably, that process, that procedure there, will likely be strengthened at this point. Yes, because they just take a look at your pass and say, go on through. And, and if this guy, even if he was with a group of people, they would assume maybe he was with that group. Uh, well, they would, again, if it was a group of people, they would still, uh, they would still have to go through the magnetometers. It's only, uh, bona fide MPs, staff, and media that go through the other entrance. 
I've noticed in some of the commentary about this, they're very concerned that the Prime Minister's office in a different building than the Parliament buildings is not offset from the street like the buildings are themselves, where there's a big grassy gap that a person would have to run across, where at least you might be able to pick them up on a security camera. Do you think around that office now we're going to see deeper and in-depth defense? Well, the Prime Minister's office is also up a level of stairs. It's on an upper floor. So... <coughs> probably less likely from that perspective. Um, in the wake of 9-11, the security around the Parliament buildings was uh, was revamped, uh, you know, those years, and uh, things like bulletproof glass was added and, and various sundry other security uh, uh, procedures and protocols were added in, including, as I said, uh, discussed earlier, the magnetometers for general public. And I know when you have a public building like the White House or the Parliament buildings, they don't want the security to take away from the beauty of these uh, national treasures. Is well, they it also have to be open to the citizens. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a fine line again. They they need to be secure because clearly they're a target, um, but yet they want to be open and be able to access uh, members of the public, their constituents, uh, you know, other people that they want to come in and see them and have meetings with them. You know, so you, you have to tread that fine line between open and accessible and uh, security conscious as well. And the uh, sergeant of arms was quoted as saying he wanted to make the parliament building secure for the people who, of course, do their business there. But he said also for the families who come there on sunny days and play frisbee on the lawn. And that's true. You know, most of the photos you see of Parliament Hill, I saw some of them tweeted out today, uh, saying you know, these are normally the photos we see of uh, Parliament Hill, and this one was a massive yoga class taking place on the grass. You know, so that's normally what happens. A lot of people do use the grounds there. There is a security checkpoint at both ends, uh, at, at the Wellington Street entrances, uh, for vehicle checks and the RCMP man knows. Uh, so once you pass that, the grounds are free and clear. The secondary screening point becomes when you want to enter into uh, center block. A lot of people, though, will be calling for tighter security, maybe more visible security as a deterrent, but we all know if you have enough people who are determined enough, just about any kind of security measure could be overcome, couldn't it? Well, again, you you have to weigh the risk you're trying to uh, you're trying to prevent. Uh, in, in any security uh, analysis, you do uh, what's called a risk analysis, and then you try and design security programs and protocols to uh, to minimize that risk. So uh, you know that's just part of that process. We'll have more with security expert Leo Knight right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600. 604-699-8600. In Goddard We Trust. Welcome back to the Goddard Report. We're talking to security specialist Leo Knight. Leo, now taking a look at the future, do you think Canadians will have a little more appreciation of the measures that the government has taken trying to track down suspected homegrown terrorists as this uh, shooting suspect is uh, suspected to be? Well, I think it should, uh, and properly so, wake a great many Canadians from the stupor they've been in. Uh, you know, it, it won't happen here. It's the the bad guys to the south of us who attract all the attention. Well, it's not true. Uh, the attention is uh, is clearly focused on the West. Um, the leader of ISIS said in the video two weeks ago where he named Canada, the UK, the United States, and I believe France as targets, and he asked, asked his followers and believers to to conduct just exactly these sorts of acts. Now, would it have made a difference if Canada hadn't been uh, part of the, the group that responded to the threat from Afghanistan and so on and just stayed to what people call the traditional peacekeeping role? Or is it time for Canada to move out of that and say, that's just an illusion, they'd still go after us? Well, I think, uh, I think Al-Qaeda declared war on the West uh, with the attacks on 9-11. Uh, you know, then there was the, the London subway bombings, the bombing, the train bombing in Spain. It's it's the West. It's it's the decadent West. That's who they're at war with. You know, we're uh, we're as much a part of that as uh, as the United States. It just is what it is. So, just saying, uh, you know, we're all for peace and love. I, I'm sure everybody is. 
But the fact that these mean people are out there, whether you try to pretend that you were a neutral country or not, if they've decided you're a target, you're a target anyway. So you might as well try to do something about it. You don't have a choice. Uh, you may not want to go to war, but sometimes uh, war is declared upon you. And again, uh, it was interesting, though, that the name of the shooting suspect was released first by American media, and the Canadian media were still being told by police that they had no information to release. I think the name came out of the FBI initially. That's right. right. Yeah, and they got it from the RCMP. Well, they were working... The, <coughs> the agencies work very closely together. Uh, it's been the case since 9-11 and the follow-up. In fact, that's what led to the whole uh, Maharar uh, debacle was, was the close cooperation between the RCMP, CSIS, the FBI, and the CIA. Um, as soon as the Mounties identified the shooter... They would, their protocol would be to go through all of their files and also immediately transmit the name to the FBI and get any information they have, uh, as well as they try and put together a picture of who this guy is, who he may be associated to, and whether or not anybody else might be involved. He had a, a history of drug convictions in Quebec, and apparently he also spent time in jail in Vancouver. He, yeah, I he, think those were also drug, uh, drug issues. And then he had a sort of a, an epiphany on the road to Damascus, as it were, and uh, converted to Islam. Wow. Goes from uh, a crime that basically is self-harm to one of harming others. Not yes. a not a great way to convert to a better life, I don't think. And, yes. and, and also, uh, was there anything that could have hinted? His past record, I mean, if it was drugs, you wouldn't suspect that he was going to become a terrorist, I wouldn't think. Well, there is information, and I haven't confirmed this yet. But uh, there is information, the Globe Mail had it earlier, that uh, he was, he had been uh, interviewed by the RCMP, National Security Team. They did remove his passport, so he couldn't travel abroad. Apparently, he was trying to get to Turkey in order that he could get into Syria. Um, they removed his passport, much much the same story as that guy last week in uh, uh, in Quebec, who, uh, who ran over those two soldiers, sa the same movie. Um, the question I would have out of that is this. I mean, there was 90 passports seized in that particular operation of, from 90 different individuals. Well, two of those individuals have now killed people in terror attacks. Uh, yeah. What about the other 88? Have we got 88 more of these to go? Right, and I'm just wondering the same thing. And if they've lifted their passports, could they not have special legislation where these guys would be electronically monitored? What are they up to? I mean, two of their buddies already, maybe they're not buddies in the technical sense, but certainly people who were up to nasty things came, come from the same profile. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, they're, they're of similar minds, and this is what's happened in the two weeks since uh, um, uh, ISIS leader uh, issued that proclamation in video. Um, you know, I, I don't uh, want to have to be talking to you or anybody else in the media about, you know, another 88 times these things happen. Um, something's got to be done proactively. I'm sure those discussions are being had at high levels uh, as we speak in terms of what it is they can do under current law. And, uh, and you know, that's uh, I'm not a part of those discussions. You're a former officer where I'm sure you had information about people, but all you could do was watch and observe and couldn't take action until they did something. It, it, yeah, exactly. The You know, the, the watchword in policing is, you know, you may know what the person's done or is about to do or can do, is capable of, but you can, until you can prove it, you can't do much about it. So you've got to just be vigilant and try and uh, get get the information and the evidence you need so you can take action. And until then, it's a waiting game. Perhaps they should be awarded a free camping trip to Baffin Island for nine years. <laughs> I heard one way I got you say, okay, they give them their passports back and send them out of the country, then we'll free them. Yeah, and then, of course, our <laughs> allies would have to put up with them. Well, that's true. I mean, then they would, there's no question they would pick up arms in, uh, in, in Syria or Iraq. So, you know, you fight them one way or the other. Leo, I know some of these people who have become, uh, uh, I don't know what you call radicalized. They seem to think it's some kind of a, a glamorous thing to do to go out and take out an enemy and go out in a blaze of glory. I don't think there's anything glorious about laying on a cold granite floor in a big building in Ottawa with, uh, you know, being shot to death because you thought your beliefs were better than somebody else's? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can't, I cannot, and nor can you, Jim, understand the mentality of these people or the the twisted vibrations or whatever that go through their synapses and how they arrive at these conclusions that this is somehow a good way of life. Um, I can't get there. I don't understand it, and uh, and I likely never will. Well, I've seen uh, a young man interviewed who. A Canadian who thought this would be a glamorous way of life, he did join the jihadists and then realized that it was a bloody slaughter and torture of innocent people. That changed his mind quite a, uh, around, and he came back to Canada and actually helped track down some of these people. So for some of them, you know, it's you hear these stories now from Europe where young women are joining ISIS and they think, oh, I'm going there for the glory of God, and they end up being sex slaves. Yeah, that was it. Kids, those women that were stopped, I think it was yesterday, the girls from Colorado. Yep. You know, how does a 15-year-old girl decide that that's a good thing to do? You know, I just can't get my head around it. Well, yeah, for the average person, but again, for people who are blinded by some kind of, uh, I guess, they think a greater good, uh, being a, a very bad person in the minds of most people in this world seems to be the right thing to do. Indeed. Uh, do you have any ideas on how... They could act on this, or you're saying something has to be done about those other 88 people who... Well, at the, at the very least, you know, they know that there are 90 people that they've seized passports from for their radicalized beliefs, and they did that to try and stop them from leaving the country to go to uh, Syria, Iraq, and fight for ISIS. Uh, the problem you have is if they can't go over there and kill, then they'll kill where they are, and that's here. And, uh, you know, the cases today and the case a few days ago just south of Montreal seem to indicate that's exactly where their, where their heads are going. So now we've got a problem about these other 88, and what do we do about them? You know, the, is, is there, uh, any there practical is provision. Way, yeah, is there any practical way to actually watch these people 24 hours a day? Well, you can contain them. Uh, if, if the, again, there has to be the will to do it on the part of the government. Uh, but under the uh, counterterrorism law, there is what's called uh, the watch list that they can be put on, and, and in fact, in a minister's certificate can order their detention um, indefinitely, unless and until they can prove that they're not a danger. So that that law does exist. That law was enacted post 9/11. Uh, we've had a few high-profile cases where people who were held on minister certificates. I don't know that there's any still in custody, but they've uh, they certainly took them out of the battle for uh, a number of years. Uh, like I said, a nine-year camping trip to Baffin Island would be fun. <laughs> yeah, a little detention camp up there would be good. Yeah, and you don't need any uh, walls or gates or guards. You have 900 miles between them and civilization and nothing but polar bears in between. Yeah, much oh. to Al, Sh- Al Gore's chagrin. <laughs> Leo, thank you very much for talking to us. No problem. Anytime. And catch his column in the Vancouver Province newspaper. Does that come out on the Sunday edition? Um, I should have a piece in there this Sunday, yeah. Thank you again for talking to us. All right, thanks. You've been listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. You can find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. We're also up on YouTube. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.